I didn't know what to make of it at first. Just subtle, almost inconspicuous changes in my everyday life, yet they left me with a nagging feeling I couldn't shake. As a park ranger, I'd been working these trails for years, and I knew every inch like the back of my hand. But on random occasions, they seemed different, as if the very earth beneath my feet had shifted slightly, just enough to set my nerves on edge. I'd set out every morning on those familiar trails, those that I'd walked countless times. But every so often, something was off. A turn I swore I'd never seen, a tree that seemed out of place, or a path extending far beyond its usual reach. It was disorienting, as if the very fabric of the park was shifting when I wasn't looking. Looking back, I still can't recall when exactly it all began, and I don't consider myself paranoid. But in hindsight, I have to wonder if a little of that could have changed anything for the better. After all, in my time I had seen plenty of what the uninitiated might consider odd, or even bizarre. People would go missing sometimes, hikers getting lost or venturing too close to a ravine. One or two others, I could remember, were never found. Other times, more than once, I radioed in a rusted out car, models that were decades old and seemed to have sat there for about as long, but no one could figure out when or how they got there. Then there was the occasional abandoned campsite, usually by unscrupulous campers days prior. But the weird ones, those, I still don't know what to make of them. Not just abandoned, but so, out of place. Place, miles from any trail where I'd find them while searching for lost hikers or scouting new routes, their contents typical and yet too decomposed for their age and the recent state they were in. The headaches, though, they were something else. They always started behind the eyes, a dull throbbing that gradually grew, spreading like a dark cloud over my thoughts. I'd sit in my truck, parked under a canopy of ancient trees, clutching my temples, hoping the pain would recede, but it never did, not entirely. Even at the time, I knew it wasn't just work stress. I tried to self-medicate, even broke down and went to the doctor, but whether it came in a bottle of liquor or a pill, medicine didn't help. The episodes were no less frequent or more predictable, and as hard as I tried to keep it together day to day, people began to notice. Hey Jim, you uh, you don't look so good. You alright? My friend and fellow ranger, Eric, asked, a look of concern growing as he scanned me up and down. Yeah, fine, I sighed. Just a headache. You sure? You don't have to come with me today, he said. I'm not even sure what I'm looking for up there anyway, but they were last seen in the area a few days ago when they ran into those kayakers we interviewed, so I'm just going to make a pass and see if there's anything to it. But right now, we can't even locate the car they came with. Mary, over at the lodge, told me they'd checked out already. Could be they just left without telling anyone their plans. Nah, I groaned, rising to my feet. The lady who called it in, someone's mother, she sounded pretty distraught. She swore they were supposed to be back home by yesterday morning at the latest. I'll be fine. Suit yourself, Eric replied. There's some aspirin in the truck if you need it. I want to be back before dark. No sense wandering around out there when we can't see anything without the mag lights. I nodded, willing myself to the door with whatever coffee I had left in my system. The drive up the mountain wasn't long, but I wasn't in a state to handle the meandering little road that slithered up its side in a way that would make you forget it was even paved. By the time I climbed out and looked around, I had a fair bit of nausea to add to the throbbing pain in my head. All right, Eric announced, spreading a well-worn map of the park over the hood of the truck as if it were a canvas. He began tracing his finger back and forth through foot trails that crawled out like spider veins from the main road where we'd stopped. The kayakers said they ran into our missing hikers somewhere along the trail here. Far as they could tell, they weren't in any distress and they were headed this way. If they were coming in this direction, shouldn't their car have been somewhere nearby? I interjected, all these trails near the river converge in a few places between here and there. Could be, said Eric, unless they made it to the car and went somewhere else. I'm going to head northeast toward the river and then follow it to the bridge along the main road. I want you to check the area around these trails here in the other direction. If you can't make it to Eagle Point within the next few hours, turn back so we can make sure to meet back at the truck before dark. 
Keep your radio on and let me know if you see anything unusual. Sure, I responded. Shouldn't we bring in search and rescue? I can't justify it without at least doing a thorough sweep ourselves. First, Eric lamented, right now, we can't even say for certain they're still in the park, and if we can find anything to narrow down the search area further, they're gonna want that information. I nodded, grabbing my pack from the back of the truck and slinging it over my shoulder as I turned toward the path that led down into the woods. I'll keep you posted. Anything else I should know? I asked. Sounds good, you know as much as I do, Eric replied. Thanks for your help, Jim. It didn't take long for me to lose sight of Eric and the truck as we went our separate ways. The area was vaguely familiar to me, though I couldn't remember if I'd ever taken this particular trail before. Occasionally, I ventured into a clearing or animal track to check for trash, gear, blood. Anything that might indicate a human being had recently been there. Nevertheless, I couldn't shake the feeling. Eric was right about the couple I was looking for. Maybe they really did just leave. If they were missing, who's to say they weren't stranded somewhere along the old highway leading out of the mountains and back to civilization where the state police should be searching for them? I mean, we had reported the case as soon as it came in, but as far as the cops knew, there's no sign they'd returned from the park. My thoughts were interrupted by streams of light penetrating the dense forest. I could hear the river in the distance and wondered how Eric was getting along. I should have been getting close to Eagle Point by now, at least according to the GPS, but something was off. The trees themselves began to take on a spectral quality. Their leaves shimmered with an eerie, unnatural light, like a translucent veil concealing a hidden world. I stumbled upon an ancient, gnarled trunk, its bark festooned with grotesque shapes that seemed to pulse and writhe. The vegetation around it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. I can best describe it as both dead and alive, a grotesque mockery of nature. It was then I realized I couldn't hear anything. No birds, no insects, not even the wind. The silence was so heavy it felt suffocating. My head was pounding ruthlessly and I regretted not bringing the painkillers from the truck. As I took a swig of water and steadied myself against the monstrosity, I looked behind me toward the trail and stopped in my tracks. The uncanny, ethereal landscape seemed to stretch for miles in all directions. Even in the state I was, I knew I couldn't have gone that far from the trail. I checked the GPS again and sure enough, it indicated I was more or less where I expected to be. Still, I couldn't recognize any of the ground I had just traversed. Apart from turning around and walking back the way I came from, I couldn't tell which way the trail could be. I sighed in pain and bewilderment, reaching for my radio. I gritted my teeth and pressed the button on the side, not just because my head was killing me by now, but because I could hardly believe I'd made such a rookie mistake. Eric, it's Jim. Come in, static. Eric, it's Jim. I'm somewhere close to Eagle Point off trail, and I think I need help. Do you copy, static? A flash of anger and helplessness took hold of me as I thought of Eric reminding me to keep my radio on. There was no way we had time to get out of range, at least not on foot, even if I wasn't where I thought I was. I called again and got nothing, though it didn't seem to be getting dark yet. I knew I needed to start now if I wanted to get back before then. Relying on the GPS, I retraced my steps, but the closer it indicated I was getting to the trail, the less I recognized my surroundings. The ground felt strange beneath my feet as as I walked, like it was absorbing the sounds of my footsteps. The unsettling dread of this place was unlike anything I'd ever felt before. It wasn't just the barrenness, the absence of wildlife, or the oppressive stillness. I'd gotten turned around and lost in the past for brief periods while hiking alone, but that had only happened when I was much further off trail than I was supposed to be now. None of this made any sense. It was as if this patch of land existed in a reality of its own, governed by its own rules, unknown and malevolent. Sure enough, the GPS soon showed my location as nearly right on top of where the trail was supposed to be, but as I looked around, suppressing the fear growing inside my chest, I might as well have been a hundred miles away. I kept trying Eric on the radio, with the same result as before. It should have been getting darker by now, and I should have been well on my way back to the truck, where I was sure Eric would be waiting before long, but nothing was as it should be. I sat down on a boulder that looked like it was being consumed by some kind of blackish vein growth that reached down into the soil, exhausted and dizzy, hunger pangs joining the pulsating blows inside my head. 
If I didn't figure out what the hell was going on soon, I'd have to confront the reality of spending the night alone, lost in this alien place. Then I saw it, not more than 50 feet away, stashed in a clearing that was nowhere near any discernible path, was a blue mid-size SUV matching the description of the vehicle that belonged to the missing couple. How could I have missed it on my first pass through here? I rose cautiously, trying to figure out how it was possible for any vehicle to have made it out to wherever this was, let alone without leaving behind any apparent tracks or even disturbance to the surroundings. I checked the GPS again and saw I was supposedly near the main road, not far from where we'd left the truck. I yanked the radio off my belt. Eric, come in, it's Jim. I think I found it. I think I found their car. Do you copy? Static again. Eric, come in, it's Jim. Please. I, I took my finger off the button and cursed under my breath. I resolved to check it out for myself. Maybe I could figure out where they went. More importantly, I might be able to at least drive it back to the road and find the truck in the off chance they left a key. But the closer I got, the more confused I felt. The missing hikers were last seen just days ago, and they hadn't arrived at the park more than a few days before that. Yet what I was seeing looked as though it had been left there for months, maybe even years. I slowed, fairly certain this wasn't what I thought it was. But as I closed a gap, I could see the plates match their car. This, this can't be. I muttered to myself, almost hesitating to reach for the door like it was some kind of trap. A chilling, otherworldly shriek pierced the silence, so suddenly my whole body flinched and I fell down in shock. It was a high-pitched, inhuman wail that somehow managed to penetrate the draconian calm, reverberating through the forest like a bell. I've heard the calls of countless animals in my time, but this, before I could collect myself, it rang out again, closer this time. My head throbbed harder than ever and I was overcome by inescapable vertigo. My symptoms intensified as whatever this thing was closed in. I clawed my my way towards the car, raised myself up to the handle of the rear passenger door, and threw myself inside. I don't even remember turning to close the door behind me before I passed out, just as the howls of my pursuer reached the clearing. When I came to, I struggled through what felt like a nasty hangover to get my bearings. Bleary-eyed and disoriented, I scanned the thick layer of dust that covered the interior, choking on a few hours worth of stale air. I finally tried to sit up when I noticed it. I sat straight, leaning closer. Two sets of what looked like human eyes sat neatly on the dash, viscera still attached, like they'd been pulled out and placed there. I didn't even have time to inspect the blood spattered across the inside of the windshield before my gut sent me flying out the door, retching uncontrollably. Then I froze, remembering yesterday's events. Or was it yesterday? I wasn't sure. The forest was deathly quiet again, no sign of whatever had made those awful noises. The same, almost artificial light streamed through the thick woods, as though hardly a moment had passed since then. My pack was still on the ground where I dropped it falling down, and I checked the radio. I tried every channel I could, looking for Eric or, well, anyone at that point. But all I found was that the battery was low. But how? I had grabbed the radio off the charger back at the station before I came up here. How long had I been out for? The battery should have lasted for weeks, if not months. I regained my composure and checked for keys. My heart leapt as I heard them jingle in the ignition, but immediately sank when I turned it over. Apart from the keys themselves, I didn't hear a sound. The car was dead. I'd have to walk out of here, wherever here was. I tried the GPS again and did my best to follow where I thought the main road should have been, but it wasn't. I saved the location of the car and hoped I'd be able to bring back law enforcement to collect the evidence of what could only be a crime scene. Little did I know, that was nothing compared to what lay in store. I trudged on, racked by hunger and with a dwindling supply of water. I hadn't packed any food since the plan was to be back same day. According to the GPS, I was supposed to be well within familiar territory by now, not too far from the station. But everything around me was no more familiar than if I'd been dropped on an undiscovered continent. In. Fluorescent mold carpeted patches of the earth like blood spatter under a black light. Everything around looked to be in a state of death and decay, yet alive and pulsing with a synchrony that made me wonder if it was just my head or the earth itself. No matter how far I walked, I never saw or heard a single living thing nor any sign of a trail or pathway. I made a beeline for the station, but never seemed to get any closer. All the while, there was that growing sense, gnawing at the edges of my consciousness, that someone or something was watching me. Strange marks and patterns were etched, no, burned, into the trees, symbols 
symbols that defied all understanding, yet alluded to hidden meaning. I tried to focus. I had to keep going, somehow. Something terrible had happened to those hikers, and one way or another, I had to get splat. I staggered and lost my balance on something slippery and wet as a viscous mass hit me in the head from above, toppling me to the ground. Dazed, I raised my hand to my face and gagged, seeing the foul mucus that now coated it in a thick layer. More of the same ran down my face and back, and I struggled to wipe it from my eyes. I reached out to steady myself against a tree so I could stand. Or rather, what I thought was a tree. What should have been rough bark of some variety instead had a fleshy texture that gave way under my grasp. I jumped up, startled, when a cacophony of groans seemed to emanate from it in a crescendo. I pulled my hand away to see deep red rivulets mixed in with the mystery goo. Reeling back instinctively, I saw where it was all coming from. This tree was more like a profane amalgamation of what looked like human body parts, twisted and smashed together into something like a tree. Arms, legs, torsos, even heads with mouths agape that were likely the source of the haunting sounds. The disgusting mass seemed to recoil in kind, sending even more of the mucus oozing off its branches and down the trunk I had just leaned on. I stumbled over a small square object that slapped wet against the mossy fleshy surface of the ground and contrasted with its fluorescence. A wallet. I bent to pick it up and could just make out the name on the ID inside. It belonged to one of the missing hikers. I choked down bile as the implications sent my stomach heaving all over again. In my state of shock, only one thought kept running through my mind. I've got to get out of here. Hoisting my pack higher towards my shoulders, I grasped the straps and started running. I didn't know where to or how long I could keep it up, but everything I was seeing, what I could process of it anyway, told me I had to. Miscellaneous belongings were scattered all around. Backpacks, sleeping bags, tents, old cameras, trash, food, even a steering wheel and a tire, all in various stages of decay, littered my path as I ducked and dodged unimaginable horrors, like the tree that wasn't a tree, pools of blood red liquid, creeping, writhing viscera, bushes of blinking eyes and shrubs composed of what appeared to be antlers, fur and rotting meat greeted me at every turn. The pain in my chest grew harder to ignore with each step, and my pounding head sapped any strength I might have had. My pack grew heavier and I slowed. I eventually collapsed to the ground in surrender as the load slid off, thudding on the ground behind me. The forest floor felt warm and inviting against my face as it sunk in like a pillow. The cadence of its haphazardly fluorescent covering seemed to hold my body in place as I willed it to move. The harder I tried, the faster my strength seemed to drain from me in waves of drowsy oblivion. The relief I felt when my headache began to subside was so sublime, I almost gave in for sheer gratitude in that moment. But then, I heard it, that same, horrible, shrill roar jolted me to my senses, familiarity triggering my adrenaline. A second, closer this time, sent me sprawling to my hands and knees. I clawed desperately at the ground, too skittish to take my chances with my surroundings again. By the time the third rang out and picked up its cadence, I made it to my feet, running as fast as I could. I didn't stop to think about my pack or the fact I was fleeing my only source of supplies. I didn't think about my burning legs or even the throbbing ache that returned to my head as I sucked in ragged breaths. I just ran for my life. I fled that god-awful noise with everything I had left in me and yet, it seemed to grow closer and closer just like the first time I heard it. There was nowhere to turn, no path or car or anything I dare try to hide in. Fear forced me forward, hopping over and around monstrosities that barely registered at this point. Just when the howls reached their deafening zenith and the eyes I could swear were boring into the back of my skull told me it's over, I turned to look at my pursuer. Maybe it was a reflex I could no longer stifle. Perhaps I instinctively turned to fight when I thought I was going to die. Crash. Before I had a chance to find out, I found myself tumbling head over heels as blinding light spun into green grass over and over in my field of view. I landed flat on my back, knocking the wind out of myself as I stared up at the most beautiful blue sky I'd ever seen. I lay there, stunned, afraid to move, afraid to think. The eerie, grim silence was replaced by birds singing from the tree line. The wind gently swept through the green grass at the bottom of the hill where I'd ended up somehow where insects chirped and hummed. I rolled to my side, searching frantically for whatever had been chasing me. I looked all around, but just like the last time, whatever it was had suddenly vanished as quickly as it had appeared. With the immediate threat apparently gone, my body rudely reminded me of its condition. I heard everywhere and something was wrong with my skin besides minor cuts and bruises. It was different. 
dried, almost leathery, cracked, and looser in places it shouldn't be. I felt more than exhausted, drained, though my usual headache had dulled for the most part. I still struggled to get to my feet. When I'd steadied myself enough to notice the ranger station in the distance, I couldn't have jumped for joy if I'd wanted to. All I could do was start walking, slowly, painfully, but determined to get to safety at last. I looked behind me where I'd crash landed from, but it might as well have been the moon. From where I stood, there was no sign of anything like what I'd just gone through, for what seemed like at least a day or so. Were it not for the intensity of my hunger and thirst, or the dried goop still stuck to my tattered uniform, I could have doubted it myself. All I knew for certain was that I could see the ranger station up ahead, but hope turned to rage when I saw Eric's truck parked out front. He had left me there. What else could it mean? To think he didn't even bother to stay and look for me. That had to be the reason I didn't find the truck or any sign of him when I came back. But why hadn't he answered me on the radio? Was this some kind of sick joke? I threw open the door to see Eric, sat at his desk, mouth ajar, and color draining from his face. What the, oh my god, Jim, is that you? How in the, where? Eric stammered, visibly shaking as he stood from his chair. He met me across the floor, tentatively, like he wasn't too sure whether I was a ghost. I wound up to punch him square in the mouth, but only succeeded in knocking myself off balance as my useless body crashed again in a heap. He awkwardly clutched my arms to arrest my collapse, hosting me into the chair behind me. Alright, alright. Hey, easy now, Jim. It's me. It's Eric. I know damn well who it is. I shot back. You left me. Jim, I just take it easy. You've been through a lot, clearly. Are you, well, hurt? Eric asked reassuringly, am I hurt? I chuckled with indignant mockery, am I hurt? Well let's see, first there was the fact you never once answered me on the radio after you reminded me to keep it on for exactly that purpose, or even came looking for me while I wandered around with no food and barely any water for hours, maybe even a couple days, I don't know. No, you just hopped in the truck and ditched me there because there were so many more important things to do sitting around here, I raged, gesticulating as wildly as my frail frame would allow. Jim, buddy, here, Eric interrupted himself, handing me a bottle of water. My pride couldn't hide the desperation, my hands shaking uncontrollably, raising the bottle to my lips. I gulped greedy mouthfuls as he continued, trying to hide the look of pity and disgust on his face. I can call an ambulance, but they'll take a couple hours to get up here. Let me at least drive you to the visitor center before they close. That way you can get checked out at the clinic and wait there. No, I spat between gasps. I don't need your help anymore. I quit, and I'm suing you in this whole damn place. You left me there to die. Now Jim just calm down. Please, really? Eric pleaded, handing me some jerky and trail mix from the cabinet. When you didn't come back before dark, I called it in and set off searching for you myself. For hours, we had people up there scouring the woods. All the other rangers, Jack, Holly, Barb, everyone, search and rescue, even some volunteers. We scoured the woods for days and even nights. Honestly, do you really think I would just abandon you like that? Yeah right, I retorted, though food and water had settled my anger considerably. There's no way in hell you did all that before I walked back here on my own. Lying just makes it worse. Jim, Eric protested, I'm not saying I don't believe you, but are you sure you're remembering right? I scoffed, don't try to turn this around on me, you crazy bastard. It's too late. I survived. I'm back. Jim, Eric said again, you've been missing for three weeks. A little over, actually. That's impossible, I shouted, and tried to raise myself from the chair, some strength finally returning. But Eric cut me off. My friend, Eric said, how long have we known each other? How many years? Do you really think I would do all this to you? For what? Come on now, you're probably delirious after what you've been through. I muttered under my breath, readying another salvo, but he continued, sighing, Look, if you don't want to go to the hospital right now, we can talk it out. But you need to rest, at least. Eat and drink some. I'm sure you know that as well as I do. I don't need a damn wet nurse. I said, you have no idea what's out there. What I've seen. People are in danger. I found the car, Eric. Oh god, their car. Their eyes. We gotta, we have to do something. Jim, please, Eric interjected. 
tell you what, I'll make you a deal. It'll be dark soon. I'll put a fire on. You can help yourself to some more food and water and tell me all about it. Then, you'll let me drive you to the visitor center. From there, you can decide if you're okay to drive home or to a doctor. I resented being treated like some kid who got sick at school, but I reluctantly agreed, convinced by my aching exhaustion. As he set about lighting the stove, I spilled everything, getting lost, calling him on the radio, finding the car, being chased by that howling, monstrous creature. I left out most of what I could remember about trees made from missing campers or shrubs from unfortunate wildlife. I scared skipped over the inescapable feeling that, whatever that place was, it was something unnatural, profane. Eric doubted my mental and physical health as it was, and I was in no mood to take a trip to the hospital on a ranger's salary. I focused on the timeline, certain there was no way I could have been gone, let alone survived out there, for three weeks. I showed Eric the spot saved on the GPS where I'd found the car, and he agreed to go take a look at it the next day, but he sounded more non-committal than what I anticipated, having told him about the body parts on the dash. I finally stood to stretch my legs and thought about heading over to the couch for the night instead of going back out into the frosty autumn evening when I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the window. I rubbed my face, wondering if the sagging, grayed visage before me was some injury or a cruel trick of the light. Hey, where you going? Eric asked, surprised to see me hurrying to the washroom. Wait a minute, Jim. He called after me as I reached the mirror. An involuntary cry of terror and disbelief escaped me. My face, my body, all of me looked so much older. Middle-aged as I was, I was used to seeing a few new grays or the occasional wrinkle appear overnight. But this was different. I looked like I'd spent a decade or more out there since I'd last seen myself. Patches of fine, gray wisps tumbled down to my shoulders, and a scraggly beard of the same hue covered my face. My eyes sagged and the skin around my chin and neck hung loosely from my skull. I just stood there, rubbing, tugging and scratching at the stranger in the mirror, muttering incoherently, I'm sorry, Jim, I'm so sorry, Eric said, standing in the doorway. This wasn't supposed to happen. I didn't know. I swear to you I didn't know. Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacy, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you guys supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.